Thank you, Dave and Carol, for that beautiful anthem and uh, sharing your gifts for the Lord this morning. Well, the title of today's sermon is Rapture in Reverse. And let me start off by saying the year was 1999. And something really big was supposed to happen that year. See if you remember a little thing called Y2K. It was a really big deal at the time, right? Some people even thought it was going to be like the end times. And if I remember correctly, it was basically believed that uh, because of a glitch in all of these computer systems, it was going to cause everywhere in the world to go haywire when the clock struck midnight on New Year's Eve going into the year 2000. And there were rumors that power grids were going to go down, hospital systems and patient files will be lost, and banks and ATMs would go down, and you would not be able to get your money out. I remember being a freshman in high school at the time, and, and Y2K was not the highest on my list of priorities. Uh, high on my list of priorities were passing algebra and talking to any girl who would look my way when we were passing in the hallway. And those two things were not on the same level right there, those two things for me. But if you're old enough to remember, you'll know that for a lot of people, there really was some worry when it came to Y2K. Uh, there was end times talk. There was revelation talk, end of the world talk. Well, obviously, that didn't happen. In fact, nothing really happened at all. Life just kept moving forward as we entered into the new year. And I learned from that whole experience that people's predictions about the end times don't come to pass. You know, every few years somebody gets really fired up about the end of the world. And so far, they are undefeated in being wrong every single time. Today we're going to look at the final act of Scripture, the new creation. And we've seen all throughout the series that God is in the business of renewing creation and blessing the whole world. God is in the business of undoing our sin and our rebellion. God is in the business of making the world right. And so as we recite in the Apostles' Creed every single week, for that to happen, Jesus is going to come to judge the living and the dead. So we come to that scary book of Revelation. The last book in our Bibles, and a lot of people don't know what to make of Revelation. That's understandable. It's kind of a confusing and complicated book. But there's some really good stuff in there, especially the part we're going to look at this morning. Now, you see, the main idea of Revelation is that God is going to win in the end. That God will do away with everything that has caused harm and destruction in our world. And God will make all things new. So this passage that we're going to read is a real biblical picture of what the true end times are going to look like. So I invite you to hear these words today from Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look, God's dwelling is here with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples. God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no more mourning, crying, or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I'm making all things new. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, All is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will freely give water from the life-giving spring. And those who emerge victorious will inherit these things. I will be their God, and they will be my sons and daughters. But for the cowardly... The faithless, the vile, the murderers, those who commit sexual immorality, those who use drugs and cast spells, the idolaters and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This is the second death. Church, this is the word of God for we the people of God. And we say together, thanks be to God. Well, I'm sure all of us in the room have heard and know the expression of going to heaven when we die, as we should. 
As Jesus tells the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Meaning that even after death, that thief is going to be with Jesus. But did you know that scripture doesn't say that that heaven destination is the climax of the story? You see, the Bible never says that eternity will be us just kind of floating around on a cloud somewhere, just hanging out forever. It's not what it says. One of my favorite cartoon strips from the far side showed this man after he had died. He was sitting on a cloud and he had his angel wings and a halo over his head. And he's sitting on this cloud by himself and he's got a thought bubble going on over his head. And he's thinking to himself, I wish I would have brought a magazine. Because I'm kind of bored. I wish I would have brought a magazine. He's just sitting there doing nothing, hanging out in the clouds, nothing going on. It's kind of like when you go to that second waiting room at the doctor's office. You know, you got the first waiting room and there's magazines out there. Then you go to the second one and there's nothing in there and you're just bored until the doctor comes in. Thank goodness that's not the picture of eternity that the Bible gives to us. In our reading from Revelation, we come to the true climax of the story. That it's all been building towards. John sees all of creation being renewed. And then he sees the new Jerusalem coming down to earth. Scholars believe that this is the heavenly church. This is the perfected people of God coming to earth. And heaven and earth come together in the last scene. And God will dwell here with his people forever. You see, this creation that God has spent so much of his time and energy and passion on, he's not going to scrap this and walk away. No, John says there's a day coming when God is going to make all things new. And then there will be no more pain, death, no more sickness, and no more sorrow. So when you hear talk about the end times, I want you to think about what's actually in the Bible and not get caught up in the stuff that's not in the Bible. Uh, Like the idea of the rapture, which is a word that is not found in your Bible, by the way. Uh, The rapture is the idea of Jesus coming back secretly and, and taking all of his people back to heaven as he destroys the world. But what scripture actually teaches is more like rapture in reverse. Instead of God snatching us away into heaven and destroying the world, God is going to come down to us. And he's going to bring heaven with him. And heaven and earth will come together like a marriage. And the whole creation will be renewed and restored. This picture of the end times according to the Bible is not one of doom and gloom and fear and annihilation and destruction. The end times is not about fear. And anybody who tries to motivate you with fear, like a a TV preacher or a politician, let me tell you they're wrong about that. Because the end times is not about fear. It's about the renewal of the world. It's about the restoration of creation. It's about the healing of all the harmful effects our sin has brought on the world. It's about a new heaven and a new earth coming together as one, as God dwells with his people forever. If you think back to the Gospels, you'll remember that Jesus is raised from the dead into this whole new kind of glorified, living, physical body. The resurrected Jesus is not a ghost going around and haunting the disciples after he comes back. No, he's real. He's physical. He's got a real body. He's present. And the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn of the dead. Well, what does that word mean? It means he's not going to be the last one, right? And the way I see it is that after we die, we do go to be with God. That's what heaven is all about. That's what we look forward to. And we're going to sing about heaven in just a few minutes at the closing song. But we know that's not the end of the story. One day, all of it's going to be renewed. God will bring heaven and earth together. And we will have resurrected bodies just like Jesus. And we'll dwell in God's new creation forever. Now, you probably wondered to yourself before, well, who exactly is going to be there? Who's going to be in the new creation? Is everyone going to be there? Is everybody going to be saved? The fancy theological word for that is universalism. The belief that everybody is going to be reconciled to God in the end. But I don't think the Bible actually teaches that. Uh, It seems to me that Jesus will let those who wanted nothing to do with him in this life have their own way. You know, it's not that God sends people to hell unjustly or unfairly. I believe they'll 
send themselves away from the presence of God and his love. You see, if people don't want to be a part of God's new creation, then I believe God will say, okay, have it your way. I don't think God is going to force anybody to be a part of the new world. And John is really clear here, you saw it in that last verse, that there are all kinds of people who will experience that second death, that lake of fire. But we can trust that our God is the perfect judge, the just and fair judge, and that that's his role to do and not ours. You know, we can't judge anybody into heaven. We can't judge anybody into hell. We can't make any bold proclamations about who's in, who's out, who's where. That's not our job. But that is the job of our just and good judge. It's also interesting to note, did you pick this up, that the Bible starts off with creation and then it ends in new creation? Remember that first part of the Bible? God's very good creation, the Garden of Eden? Well, think about the new world as Eden restored. Eden even better. Where all of that stuff that has harmed the world is done away with. And this redemption will be cosmic in scope. It's going to be big, bigger than we can even wrap our minds around. You see, today, salvation is not an escape from this world. Salvation will be the renewal and the restoration of this world, the healing of the world. And that's what we have to look forward to, y'all. That is our hope as Christians. That is what Jesus invites us to enter into as we follow him. Now, you may be wondering this morning, well, what does any of this have to do with us here today? Are you kidding? This has everything to do with us here today and how we live our lives. You see, as God's people, as people who are wrapped up in Jesus, the church, we are now part of God's new creation right here and now. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. So we live as new creation people. And we live that out right here in the midst of the old world. So what that means for you is that anything you do in this world that is good and righteous and holy and loving, anything that looks like God, anything that looks like Jesus and loves like Jesus is not going to be wasted in the new creation. It all matters. It all matters what we do. We can also look forward to the present things that, that are not going to be in the new creation, and we can work to make that a reality in our own lives today. For example, I don't think anybody is going to judge anyone else by the color of their skin when we get to the new creation. I think that all of God's children are going to be gathered there as one family. And so if we have a problem with people of a different skin color now, then we need to take care of that right now. It's time to change our hearts right now before we get to the new creation. I remember hearing a story about a lady who was talking to her pastor one day, and she said this. She said, I don't mind going to the grocery store with them, but I'm not going to worship with them. Now, let me tell you, I think she's going to be in for a rude awakening when she gets to the new creation. How about you? When she's surrounded by a whole lot of thems. She might not enjoy the new creation that much then. She might not want to be there after all. I don't know. So we want to put the new creation into practice in our own lives right now. And I also don't think there was going to be a whole lot of enemies in the new creation. So maybe we should get a head start on that in our lives today and try to eliminate any enemies we might have. Now, not eliminate like take care of them, take them out. We don't want to do that, as tempting as that might be. How about we try things like forgiveness, self-sacrificial love, praying for, blessing our enemies. I don't think there are going to be things like violence and rage or bitterness or anger in the new creation. Now, some of us have a lot of work to, to do before we get there, right? You know, I look around at the world and I see people who are just so angry all the time. I look around the world and I see Christians who are just so angry all of the time. What are we so angry about? What are we so enraged for? We have a God who loves us and who has done everything to bring us salvation and lead us into new life. 
drop the rage. Drop the anger. Drop the bitterness. Drop all that stuff and pick up something that is even better. Pick up gratitude. Pick up a gracious spirit. Pick up a humble heart. Pick up a servant's life. And seek to get called up in the wonder and praise and worship of our great God. I give you permission today. We really don't have to be so mad all of the time. We really don't have to be so angry all of the time. You can drop it. You can let it go. The good news this morning is that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that the new creation has already broken into our world. And as we join our lives to Jesus, we too become new creation people. And we eagerly await that day when the entire creation is going to be renewed and restored. We live in anticipation for the day when God will make the whole world right. But until then, we live like Jesus. And we love like Jesus. We talk like Jesus. We serve like Jesus. We extend grace like Jesus. We live selflessly like Jesus. We also live as a part of this thing called the church. This different community. This uh, citizenship of heaven. This colony of heaven in the midst of earth. And we become a people of worship. We become a people of hope. We become a people who share Jesus with others. Now, let me give you a challenge for the week ahead. I think the challenge this week is to live in obedience to God in each moment. I think that's the calling for every one of us here today. Live in obedience to God in each moment. Whether we're at work or we're on a Zoom call that's going way too long, or we're at the store, we're at school, somebody cuts us off in traffic, Live in obedience to God in each moment that we're going through. Live in the love of Jesus every single moment. We don't know when the end of the world is going to come. And that's okay. We don't need to be too concerned about that. So don't go chasing after charts and maps and end times prophecies and all that stuff. There's always going to be another Y2K failed prophecy around the corner. Here's what we do instead. We live into the new creation every single day. So that when the end of our lives comes, it's not going to take us by surprise. When it comes is irrelevant. What is relevant is how we live along the way. So I invite you to live in obedience to God each moment. Because the new creation is on the way. God's new world is on the way. Restoration, renewal, the world made right. Heaven coming down to earth. And guess what, y'all? You can be a part of that. We all can. We're all invited to be a part of that. And it begins right here and now today. If you'll have it. So Hawkinsville first, let me ask you. Do you want it? Do you want it? Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the good news of new creation. We thank you for the good news of renewal and restoration in the world being made right. Lord, we want to be a part of that. We sign up for it today. And we want to live our lives in obedience to you every single moment. Lord, we don't know when the end of the world is going to come, and that's okay. We want to follow after you and be faithful to you every single moment of our lives. Uh, give us the will to follow Jesus. Give us the courage to follow after him. And help us to be the disciples and the church that we're called to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.